Uh, thank you so much all for coming. I'm going to open all the karakia. We have it right here. So, well, welcome to speak along. I'm going to do the te reo Māori side. You can see what the English side says. Uh, welcome to talk with me. E te whānau hui, ai a te mātauranga, kia mārama. Kia whae take ngā mahi katoa. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tato i a tato katoa. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Fian Delifi from Bike Auckland. I'm just doing our housekeeping and then I'm passing it on to Karen Horman, who is our chair. If you haven't met her before, um, here she is. Say hello after the thing. Uh, you would have seen the toilets just where you came in, so right opposite the reception over there is some bathrooms if you need them. Uh, emergency exit is literally back through the door you came in through. There is also another one around back through there. We probably won't use that one. It's too far away. We're going to go that way if there's any emergencies. And the meeting point is where that uh, monument is. There's a sort of a statue just on the corner out front. So if we need to, we're going to evacuate to that point. It is being live streamed and recorded. So uh, just a note that your questions will be heard by the online audience and it will be recorded for later use. So just keep that in mind with what you say. Uh, and if you don't want to be in any photos, let us know. We will be taking a few just from the back there, but let us know if you'd prefer not to be in them. And now on to our chair, Karen Horman. Hi everyone. This is my first meeting as chair, which I, I took the role a few weeks ago. So it's pretty exciting to be, for me to be standing up in front of you. And I'm actually excited about the Liberate the Lane project. I know there's some people here who have been fighting for this for years and might be thinking I'm being quite Pollyanna about it. And I'm, that's okay. But there are a few circumstances that have changed and we intend to try and leverage those and get Waka Kotahi to the table and finally allocate a lane for active modes on the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Now the Auckland Harbour Bridge is a very special piece of infrastructure. You know, it, it's an emblem for Auckland, but it's also, you know, a corridor for a lot of traffic day and night, and I think Waka Kotahi are concerned. The fragility of the network is a really big deal for them, and that leads us into why we think this is a really good time to actually get this project underway. Thanks to the great work of Richard Young, who has written the report that we're about to talk about tonight, we can see there's space on the Harbour Bridge unutilised space that we can now use for active modes. It's really clear in the data that traffic volumes have declined on the bridge since 2016. Now when you add in COVID and the impact of people working from home, there's actually more space than we've ever had. So that particular aspect is in the best state it could be in at this time. We've got three reasons why this is a really good opportunity. And it's not just traffic volumes, but it is actually the second harbour crossing as well. The reason being is, well, it's a huge project and it's 15 years away. So that's just not good enough as far as connecting up our cycle networks now. The other thing we have is just the broader global climate, which is, you know, we've got all the agencies around the world saying, promote cycling, walking, active modes. They're better for so many reasons, for the planet, for our health, for our well-being. So we've got the Climate Commission here in New Zealand saying that we should have a connected cycle route in New Zealand by 2030. You know, and if we don't get onto the Harbour Bridge now, that's just, that's just impossible. 
we've got who who's saying that those active modes should have the same rights as every other transport mode. So it's a question of equity. So those factors come into play to make this a really good time for us to absolutely demand that we have access to the bridge on our bike, on foot. Whichever way we want to go, we should be able to take the, have the choice. Now Richard's going to talk in more detail about those traffic flows, how we can move more safely across the bridge, and how he has countered a lot of the issues that have come up in the past. This is really important. We need to get all stakeholders across the line on this one. So we need to spread the word and we need to know all of this stuff so that we can talk intelligently about how this will work. So I'm going to pass over to Richard now, who's going to take you through more detail, and then we'll follow up with some questions and answers. Just talk among yourselves for a moment. There we go. At this point, I'll waft it and the, the images will appear as if by magic. Come on, come on, come on, come on, yay! Here we go. Talk amongst yourselves for a sec. Hang on, we'll make this work. Okay, well, good evening. My name is, is Richard Young. I'm hoping the technology will work for us. I think the microphone's mainly for live streaming. I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me from the back. Uh, just a little bit about myself, Richard Young. I'm a child of civil engineer. What's a child of civil engineer? Uh, I build stuff, um, and I've been doing that for the last 35, 40 years, pretty much all the way around the world. Um, I used to work for Waka Katahi, so um, I was responsible for the Waikato, or large parts of the Waikato Expressway, so I know a little bit about what I'm talking about, not much. Um, but what I do know is, is how to look at information and try and make sense of it and try and answer some of the valid questions and so try and find a way forward and find some practical solutions. I've got 15 minutes now. That was my first minute. I was allowed a minute for an introduction. Uh, liberating a lane on the Auckland Harbour Bridge for walking and cycling, or as I prefer to call it, Trevor's big day out. So, um, let me take you back to 1974 on a very wet day in 1974 and introduce you to Trevor. This is Trevor and uh, Trevor's daughter's Rally 20, three speed bike, and um, Trevor's friends. Uh, effectively, there was a bus strike, and um, the, the good people of responsible for the bridge said, well, let's let people walk and cycle across it. And they did. And it happened. And Trevor is my hero. So we'll keep Trevor in the corner because we, we really want to understand what, what Trevor's got to do with all this. Um, but there are lots and lots of reasons not to liberate a lane. The traffic volumes are too high. Uh, the peaks are back to pre-COVID. There's not enough room on the bridge. The path wouldn't be wide enough. The bridge is too steep. You can't protect people from cars. People might jump off. It may be too windy. There we go. The bridge sways. That's a good one. Um, and emergency services, they can't get to the bridge and you can't maintain the bridge. Um, it, look, I don't do a lot of audience participation, but if you've read my 124-page report, can you just wave at me now? Two people. That's really impressive. Thank you. Do you want to come and do this? <laughs> So the, the good news is, is rather than having to read 124 pages, in 14 minutes or 13 and a half minutes, I'll take you through pretty much what the report says. 
So look, the, the Bridge 101, you're more f familiar with this than I am. <clears throat> Currently it runs five plus three. So in the morning, five lanes in, three lanes out, in the evening, five lanes out, three lanes in. Um, and they move it during the day. We're proposing under this arrangement to take one lane. So there's always four lanes for peak flow and three lanes in the opposite direction. Uh, technically, if you wanted to run five lanes out of the city, you still can, but that's, that's for emergencies. So effectively, one lane for walking and cycling on the eastern side. Now I'm gonna sit down for this because oh, I keep needing the mouse to, to, to go through. Look, I'm an engineer, so I've looked at the last 10 years of traffic data. It's what I do um, every 15 minutes and try to work out how much traffic's going across. And Waka Katahi have been brilliant. They do provide all this information. So this is 1 February in 2016. It's a Monday between 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning and 29,425 vehicles headed into the city. I'm not going to do every single day. I'm going to sort of summarize it from here. So I said, well, that was when five lanes were open. What if only four lanes were open? And the answer is there wouldn't have been enough room for 943 cars or vehicles at the time, at the time they, they chose to come across. Um, but what you can see is anything below that red line is spare space, spare capacity, unused capacity. So, okay, we couldn't have gone, got away with four lanes on that day because the, the red is bigger than the, the gap. So we run it across a week. And effectively what I've done is we've looked at every day for the last 10 years um, and worked out if there was only four lanes of traffic, how much traffic would struggle to get across. 2016, about a thousand vehicles each morning. I'm gonna skip forward, I've got a whole load of animations, but I'm just gonna go forward to 2022. So this was last year. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, so Monday to Friday, six o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning, um, you can see a really peaky thing. What that means is the people in North Shore are staying in bed longer, and then they're all trying to get across the bridge at 7.30 in the morning. That was last year. That's this year, February. Um, not quite many people are staying in bed quite so long, but they're not all trying to get across at the same time. So. What this is, look, in layman's terms saying is, when there is no red, there is capacity for that whole rush hour, that whole peak period that there's space on the bridge. Any white below the dotted red line is unused capacity. There is space on the bridge. So when people say the bridge is full, uh, actually the bridge isn't full. Um, there is a significant amount of unused capacity. And what we're seeing is when it's busy, people get up a bit earlier, go a bit later. So. What I've shown you there is effectively 15 days out of the last 10 years. What I'll just pull up here is this is the average capacity of traffic on the bridge, the amount of traffic on the bridge. This is in the evening going north. Anything above that red line is more than four lanes can carry. Anything below the red line, there is spare capacity. Two things to note, obviously at the moment, you know, 20, 21, 22, 23, we are significantly below the capacity of four lanes. Waka Katahi is currently providing five lanes. But what this is showing that for an evening peak period, four lanes is actually adequate. From 2016, it's been slowly dropping. This isn't COVID related. The number of vehicles crossing the bridge at peak times has been reducing steadily, but surely from 2016, Every quarter, it's been going down. Prime reason is it's those big blue things that everyone jumps on at the park and rides. The number of people crossing into Auckland on buses now exceeds the number of people going across vehicles. So the bridge has got spare capacity. It's been going down since 2016, and it has not returned to pre-COVID levels. So that's one of the first takeaways because that has been statements that do not correlate with what the data shows. So we've done the traffic, that's all I'm going to say about traffic volumes. Uh, there's 100, of 124 pages, about 85 pages to do with traffic volumes, because I like traffic. Um, so we'll get on to the other stuff, which is to do with, well, uh, how are you going to make this thing fit? There's a drawing of the bridge. That's actually not my drawing, that's what Katahi's drawing. This is actually one of the options that they considered. 
was a four metre wide cycle lane, shared lane. So no surprise, the design I came up with is also four metres wide. It is effectively their design. Um, there's a few subtle changes, um, but what that four metre width shows is that the projected volumes of usage from Wakatahi is just under a thousand a day. I think that's probably a bit on the low side. That path, that gradient, will take about 800 people an hour, quite safely in a tidal flow situation. Um, and there's a there's an organisation called Osroads, and they design things and they they make guidance, and we've checked it all to that. And the cycleway, the shared path, would would meet that criteria. So it is possible to do within just one lane of the bridge. And again, it's been said that two lanes have been needed. We can't find the evidence for that. It's too steep. When the report came out, I had News Talk ZB on the phone within about 20 minutes. And the only question they said is, the bridge is really steep. And I said, if you stand at one end and look at it, yes, it looks really steep. But if you, you know, uh, it's 5%, that's one in 20. If you cycle, you realize that 5%, one in 20 is not steep. Um, the os roads, the guides don't even classify it as, as, as steep. Apparently, I wasn't there, children rode over it. We know that Tr Trevor rode over it, there's Trevor. Um, and similarly, Wakatahi are actually proposing one of the schemes when they eventually deliver the second crossing to repurpose part of the existing bridge for walking and cycling. So suddenly they realise it's not quite as steep as they thought it was. It's also not as steep compared to other paths, and I'll show you a little graphic just now. And then there was a concern, and I'm not making this up, that one of the biggest risks for not converting to walking and cycling was a significant number of cyclists will be doing in excess of 60 kilometers an hour and hitting people coming the other direction. Um, I don't think that's credible. What I did do is I looked at four other walking and cycling paths that Wakatar have either built or are building um, to scale for gradient and, and length. Um, so the Auckland is actually, it's not insignificant, but it's actually at the scale of um, walking and cycling paths that Wakatahi are currently providing. The one that you're probably most interested in is the purple one, which is Grafton Gully. So effectively, Grafton Gully, Auckland Harbour Bridge, not dissimilar, similar length, and the, thank you, and Grafton Gully, uh, actually a bit steeper in, in a few locations. So there we go. It's not too, it's not too steep to achieve. Uh, protection of people from vehicles. If you're only converting one lane, uh, you do need to have a barrier between the people and the vehicles. Um, this particular barrier here, it's approved by Wakatahi. It's freestanding, it sits on the bridge. Um, and because you've only got one lane of traffic, yeah, the, any trucks or any vehicles can't really get a big angle to hit it with. <clears throat> so even a full bus at 80 kilometers an hour, this barrier will move less than a meter, probably less than half a meter. In reality, people don't walk right against a barrier, they walk a bit in. It's a relatively safe solution. Also remember that on almost every other 80 kilometre road in New Zealand, pedestrians and cyclists have no protection whatsoever. So this is actually far safer than almost any other road in New Zealand. Just for information, this is the same presentation that we were, uh, gave to Akatahi last week. Anti-climb provision, uh, deterrent from uh, people climbing up and over the bridge. Uh, we do know in international research is that if you provide barriers, significant barriers, you can reduce that by 50%. Uh, I'm a Brit, although I've got a Kiwi passport, so I'm really a Kiwi. Um, Clifton Suspension Bridge, which is twice as high and 10 times older than the, the bridge we have here. Uh, they have got these barriers here uh, and they are effective. They're also effective with trained staff. CCTV and other provisions and significantly they do provide a view um, so there is a solution that we can provide to deter people from climbing on the side of the road and also to put a, a mesh up on the the side where the barrier will be just to stop things from vehicles um, in, um, coming onto the the walkway so it is possible to do it is achievable to do wind Apparently it gets windy. Um, uh, look, 
Most of the wind is from the west. Uh, the little asterisks are the OIAs. I've actually lost count of the number of OIAs we've put in on this. I think it's around 30 or 40. Um, as you all know, most of the wind is from the west. Actually, 83% of the wind is from the west, the strong wind. So we're going to put the cycleway path on the eastern side. It gives them passive protection. Not perfect. Uh, it's not possible to put wind deflectors in because of the strength of the bridge. Um, and similarly, unexpected gusts, which is one of the another main reasons why Wakatahi are very concerned about walking cycling on the bridge, was basically they said, look, gusts can occur at any time in any direction without any warning. Their data does not support that statement. Their data shows that almost all the gusts of winds are in the same direction as the prevailing wind. So we do know there are risks. You know, we've seen the uh, potential closures in the last few days. Yes, their main concern is vehicles falling over and damaging the bridge. It is a, okay, a venerable structure. You know, it's, it's a few years old now, so they do want to protect it. Um, but from that perspective, um, the path could remain open at wind speeds of up to 75, which I think is what they've been getting over the last few days. Yes, it will close. It can be closed. Um, wind socks, really cheap, really effective at giving regular users, whether on foot, on bike or in cars, a really good indication of what's going to happen to them in the next two kilometres. Um, people can make informed decisions. People on walking and cycling are much closer. They make a decision when they see the bridge. If you're 20 kilometres back and doing 100 kilometres an hour, yes, you might need to be managed more. So again, it's finding the right solution, providing the right information so people can make those informed decisions. And we are talking about having permanent trained staff always present on the bridge for lots of reasons. The sway issue. <clears throat> Second piece of audience participation. Who's seen the video? This is a video, there's, there's three videos now. Uh, basically, whenever there is a large, how do we call it, let's call it, okay, protest mask going across the bridge and it takes up two lanes. Not intentionally, people seem to do walk in step and the bridge moves. We're talking hundreds of people, if not thousands of people. And it's not one bridge up there, it's three bridges, one in the middle and one on either side. And there are two gaps, one either side. And those gaps open and close when you get thousands of people walking on the clip-ons. It's a known fact, um, but it does cause a significant hazard because there is a gap that opens and closes and you don't want to put anything in it. Uh, it should be thousands. Yeah, thousands on there. There is a solution. Uh, Wakatahi designed the solution 12 years ago, but haven't implemented as yet. Our proposal is for a single lane, which is obviously remote from where the gap is. And similarly, the forecast usage, whether it's the cons very conservative Wakatahi figures or perhaps more realistic figures of usage of pedestrians, and it is only pedestrians that cause it, cyclists, runners, scooters, don't generate this sideways sway. The number of pedestrians on there, it's implausible that you get enough people on there on a single lane to generate this sway. Having said that, yeah, we think the sway probably is something that Wakatai really need to have a look at and get resolved. So last couple of slides, maintenance and control. I'll just whiz through that. Um, yes, it needs to be maintained. We need gates on it. it needs to be CCTV, it needs to be a PA system needs to be routine maintenance walking across at the moment they have to put a lane closure on it's cost thousands there's risk associated with it for a lot of maintenance they can actually literally just walk to where they need to get to maintenance closures and who doesn't like toys how about one of these you know double-ended little trucks to, to wheel backs and forwards across the bridge or e-bikes there are solutions so that's the maintenance side and then from the the emergency side um, they already deal with crashes and breakdowns so they have solutions for that Train bridge staff, this is that photo is actually a guy in Sydney um, where they have trained staff for first responders, councillors, also visible reassurance and enforcement for those cyclists that might be tempted to go anything more than 30 kilometres an hour. Also public ambassadors for the bridge. If you talk to the, the guys on Sydney Harbour Bridge, the, the, the knowledge they have of everything is phenomenal. Ambassadors. So you've got the CCTV, the path wide enough to get fire trucks through uh, and then you know certain um, special vehicles as required so 
these are a lot of the um, the challenges that have been raised about why we can't do walking and cycling on the bridge. I've had 13 minutes. That's 11 of them. That's pretty much what I've told you. Um, some of them are more challenging. As an engineer, this is not a perfect solution. The problem is, is that perfect solutions are quite often means you don't get good solutions. So what I've tried to find is a pragmatic, realistic way uh, that we can deliver this um, relatively quickly, certainly within a year, uh, and it could be done. So here's Trevor. I really hope Trevor will have his big day out, and um, we shall wait and see what happens. I know there's going to be time for questions and discussion later on, so I'll pass back. Okay, kia ora whanau. Um, my name's Sahil. I'm your moderator for tonight. And um, I think we'll just start very quickly. We're actually running quite ahead of time, thanks to Richard and Karen's commitment to timekeeping. Um, you've already met Karen and Richard, so I will let Tim, Timothy Welch, our last speaker, introduce himself before we get started. So if I could just have you up here, please. All right, good. Um, I'm Tim Welch. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Auckland. Uh, I'm a transportation planner uh, by training. Uh, I've taught transportation planning for a decade and a half or so. Um, and so I've, I've taught and researched transportation across the globe, mostly in the US. Um, but I have a, a special interest in active modes of transportation or doing the things that are necessary to help get people outside of their cars into um, more active modes, more sustainable modes. Um, and that's primarily my motivation here as well. Um, sorry, yeah, to, <laughs> to make uh, you know active mode cycling, uh, walking uh, more feasible across the bridge, and really for the North Shore in general. Awesome. Okay, so I'm just going to park up in this corner. This is my spot for the night, um, just so that our three speakers are front and center in your lines of sight. And sorry, that couch was steeper than I expected. Um, the bridge. <laughs> unlike the bridge. Um. Yeah, un unlike the bridge. Okay, so we'll start ourselves off with something really simple. And so you've met all three of our speakers and you've heard a little something about each of them. Um, so now I'm going to open up the conversation by asking each of you to share something about yourselves, like your daily routine or something like that, that would you know pertain to or benefit from liberating the lane. And um, since Karen has waited the longest to speak, we can start with you, just to put you on the spot. Thank you, Salil. I don't have a car. And so what that means is I can't get anywhere if there isn't a cycleway or a ferry or a way of getting there. And I have been in Devonport and wanted to travel when there isn't a ferry, but I have to wait. I've been in Devonport wanting to get on the ferry on a Saturday and I've been made to wait because there's too many bikes on it already. So I would like to be able to go to the beach when I want to and cycle across the bridge. So yeah, I've definitely got a vested interest. I'm calling it out. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I guess, Tim, since you're, since you're holding the mic and so sure. eager to speak. Um, yeah, here's my really dumb commute every day. Um, I get in a cargo, cargo bike, I take my two kids to school, uh, then I come back home and because I can't cycle across the bridge and the cargo bike will not fit on the ferries, or if it does fit on the ferry I won't be able to get it off because it has ridiculous right angles at whatever ramp it's decided to drop us off that day or the ramp is far too narrow. Uh, I have to switch bikes, use my other bike to uh, get on the ferry, cross the harbor and then cycle up. Uh, the steep Grafton Gully uh, to my office uh, and then do that in reverse again uh, at the end of the day. So I mean, obviously going across the bridge would save a significant amount of time for me even though it's a farther distance. Uh, I can cycle a lot faster than I can wait for the ferry and return to my house and, and do all of that. Um, and now, you know, with, with fares going back up to the, the normal price, that's not a cheap trip. 
Um, you know, I, I guess I'm fairly privileged and I can afford that trip, but for a lot of people, it's not an insignificant amount of money. If we're talking eight, nine dollars uh, per day, uh, there's a fair amount of people that could benefit significantly uh, from having a free trip. Essentially, you just have to, you know, pay for whatever fuels you uh, to cycle across that bridge. Uh, so I'd benefit from it, but but a lot of other people would too. And I just, I'll take this moment to draw attention to one of the things that Tim mentioned, specifically that um, ferries are a quite common alternative option for people outspoken against the bridge, but Tim and his family can't use the ferry because of the cargo bike. So just something to think on. Richard, over to you. Well, I, I don't live in Auckland, so I can say, well, do I get any immediate benefit from it? <laughs> um, whenever I do stay in Auckland, because I try and walk or cycle or scooter, beam or lime, others are available. Um, I'm really stuck in the south of the harbour and never get up here. And I think that's a real shame. And it's not just me, it's hundreds of thousands of people who don't have that opportunity to, to go just over the water. We think nothing of traveling two kilometers in any other direction, but we have this chasm between the city and here and as Karen's already said, the, the lack of equity. Um, I think as a country, we can resolve it. And I think we'd be better for doing that. I think perhaps something also worth throwing in there is that Richard would get the satisfaction of being right, which is you know <laughs> absolutely unparalleled. Um, and I think just, I'll be really annoying, even though you've just handed the mic over, I'll pass it back to Richard. He's got a bit of a technical question. And that would be, um, can you think of any examples of um, bridges overseas that have a lane for biking or walking? And a little pressing harder one, and I'm going to get all of you to maybe try to think about it. Bridges that have had a lane reallocated for walking and cycling as opposed to one designed in. I'll give you two. Two for the price of one. If you're into New York, the, um, the Brooklyn Bridge, classic, beautiful bridge, over 100 years old. Up until last year, the walking and cycling was on a little timber structure above the traffic. And it was about well, two and a half meters wide. And it was complete chaos up there, but everybody loved it. And then the mayor of New York said, stuff this. Took a lane of rope, traffic out, put concrete barriers down one side, and they now have a very substandard, very narrow, but incredibly effective two-way bike lane across the Brooklyn Bridge, which means that everyone can walk across safely, take photos, do the whole thing at the top, and people can commute underneath. So there's, there's the Brooklyn Bridge, absolutely iconic bridge, almost as iconic as the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Um, so that's, that's why. But the, the, the one I really wanted to share is, I used to go to school right in the middle of London in Blackfriars, and 1982, I remember walking out from the underground station around to where I was going to school, and I stopped, and I stopped because I saw a cyclist coming across Blackfriars Bridge and then heading up up towards Fleet Street. And, and, and I just was completely gobsmacked that somebody would ride a bicycle in London. <laughs> you can see where this is going. I was back there 18 months ago. It's full of the bloody bikes now. You can't, you can't go anywhere without these bikes. And, and the, the bridge that I saw one cyclist on now has a dedicated protected cycle lane in each direction. And there are more cyclists coming across that bridge than there are vehicles. So there's two examples for the price of one. I'll pass it across. Uh, I thought as the American I'd get to talk about the Brooklyn Bridge. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, No, it's significant. Uh, I mean, this is for, uh, for the U.S. This is uh, the 4th of July, so Independence Day. So it's a good day to talk about liberation. But um, one of the important things about the Brooklyn Bridge also was... Uh, that when it was moved, cycling moved from that, that uh, terrible little platform down to its own dedicated lane, within a month, cycling on the bridge doubled. Um, and it didn't take it away from, so you could cycle across already on the Manhattan Bridge, which wasn't too far away. It wasn't the most pleasant bike ride, but it had protected bike lanes and chain link fence and things like that to keep you from falling off. Um, but it didn't take a single cyclist away from the Manhattan Bridge. It, it literally just doubled the amount of people that were, that were crossing. Um, and so one of the things that we talk about um, when we talk about, let's say, removing a lane is uh, what do we do with all the cars? Um, 
and, but you know what happens when you take away the lane is the opposite effect of adding a lane, uh, or I guess re reverse induced demand. Um, and Richard talked about that a little bit. People find a different way if they know the bridge is going to be congested because there's fewer lanes uh, time, or they'll take the bus uh, because the bus is probably suitable for a significant portion of the people that are crossing the bridge at any given time, uh, or they'll decide to walk or bike, or they'll decide uh, that they don't need to cross the bridge that day. So there's all sorts of ways in which people will find um, alternatives, or even if they have to drive, they might take the Upper Harbor Bridge. So the second uh, Harbor Bridge, we, we don't talk about too much. Um, <laughs> Which, by the way, is why they're, part of the reason why there isn't as much traffic on, on uh, the main Harbor Bridge, because a lot of the freight uh, since 2016 has moved up to the, the North Harbor Bridge. Um, and once the trucks started to leave, there was significant amounts of additional capacity. Um, in March of, of this year, uh, the, the average capacity of the busiest lane on the Harbor Bridge was about uh, 1,000, or the average use was about 1,000 vehicles per hour. Um, and theoretical capacity is, Richard would know better, but um, technically you can get up to at 80 miles per hour, 1,800 vehicles per hour. Um, in perfect conditions and perfect driving, uh, but so we're significantly lower, even on the you know uh, the biggest driving month of the year, on a year that's supposed to be the return to driving. Um, so the capacity is there, um, and just like in, in Brooklyn, you take a lane, and people will find find a different way. And then the other bridge, sorry not to take all the, the bridge talking time, but um, I've cycled and walked and driven across the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, a, a notoriously windy area as well. Um, and it's a long it's a long trip, it's almost three kilometers, uh, but lots of people do it every year. Um, they worry about people jumping off the bridge. It's usually not cyclists or, or uh, pedestrians that do it, it's usually people that drive to the bridge. Um, and so things like that are just so overblown. They're, people will cross it no matter how long it is, as long as you give them the opportunity and, and they feel that it's safe. Um, and so it's, it's a good reason why we should start to think about it now. Um, I can't remember exactly the name. I'm thinking it's the Braddon Bridge or something. It's in Vancouver anyway. Uh, what? Burrard. Burrard? Burrard. Burrard. The Burrard Bridge. And about 10 years ago, it was proposed to do exactly what we're doing now, which is take a lane. And there was very stiff opposition, particularly from business associations who thought that they would lose custom, there would be Carmageddon, it would be the end of the world. And now it's one of the most cycled bridges in North America, but also happily, the Business Development Association has actually publicly retracted that comment and said they were wrong. So I think that's huge. I think that's fantastic that they will you know, now support something that they so vehemently opposed. Thank you for that. That's, um, that's actually quite fascinating because we get a lot of that sort of opposition here in New Zealand and it, it often goes unretracted even though you know, yeah. opponents are proved wrong. Um, so I guess I did see some nodding faces out in the audience when our lovely panellists were talking about some bridges. So I was just wondering if there was anybody in the audience who had anything to add to this particular part of the discussion. You're all welcome to raise your hands or not. We can just move on. Option B. Awesome. Okay. Um, so... I'm going to ask each of you, um, I think we've had the sort of more technical side of things, aka the thing that we're pushing for is very viable and can be done. And, and now I think I'd like to know, and I think everyone in the crowd would like to know, what is something that we individually could potentially do to push for something like this? And I think I'll start by asking you, Karen, as the chair of the people-led organisation behind this push. No pressure. Well, I guess it's just back to what I mentioned before, which is, you know, we need to keep it in the conversation. We need to know the answers to all of these things, which you guys are here doing, which I think is amazing. Um, one of the key things I think that's going to come out is Waka Kotahi is going to say, well, look, we've got a plan. 
Mm. You know, we've got the second harbour crossing. Mm. And, you know, that's all it is at the moment. It's a plan. It's in the never, never, 15 years away probably. And that isn't going to meet any of our needs. You know, we'll be unable to ride a bike by that stage, some of us. <laughs> um, I'm not hoping for that, but, you know, it's possible. But what I do think we are offering Waka Kautahi is an opportunity to start the behaviour change now. We put the lane on the bridge and we get everybody accustomed to making those decisions that Tim has already mentioned of choosing other ways to travel and everyone learning that they can contribute and help with sustainability, that they can ride a bike and be healthier, that we can have less air pollution and less noise pollution, and we can have equity in our transport choices. So that's what I want to push for Waka Kotahi to understand, is that this is an opportunity and it fits right in with their goals for the second harbour crossing. I think one thing that we can get hung up with is going into conflict with pe people who oppose something out of principle. And there's very little point trying to persuade people that do not want to have their minds changed. But what I think there is, is there is a significant number of people that are open and will listen to reasoned arguments or listen to um, myth busts of why it can't be done, why it can be done. So anything that we can do on those one-on-one -on -one engagements uh, with people who are willing to, to listen, willing to understand, um, I think we have a perfect opportunity to, to do that with you know, the information that is, that is out there and, and it is available. So uh, that would be my takeaway is that if you know um, what the challenges are. You're as well equipped as, as I am or anybody else are to, to myth bust the things that, oh, it's too big, it's too steep, it's too difficult. Mm. It's not. It's not. It's really easy. It's actually really quick and it's pretty cheap. But not, I'm specifically talking about what the values are, but it ticks so many boxes. Um, and the more that information can get shared, the better. Yeah, I mean, I think where you and the audience um, are tuning in are already doing part of the things that you need to be doing uh, to get projects like this across the line, which is is being informed and being involved um, and showing up. I mean, if we if we look at examples, so if we look at the the Great North Road improvement that was just passed last week, the reason it was passed wasn't because. A politician a representative came and decided it was a good idea it was because people on the ground in the community fought for it hard and for a number of years um, and pushed harder and harder and showed up at every meeting and were vocal and were louder in many cases than those that opposed it um, and that's the sort of thing that happens is is there's a group of people that are uh, energized and informed and, and show up and, and make the conversation happen uh, when it's too easy for those things to be ignored or for a single individual or a group of individuals to be listened to over everyone else. Uh, so it's being involved in, in things like this, being involved in, in uh, council meetings even uh, at all levels. It's writing uh, you know, an op-ed or writing to the editor of the paper. Uh, these things get listened to, they get read uh, by representatives as well. Um, it's, it's keeping it on the front page, it's keeping it in, in people's ears. Um, that's the thing that kind of sways opinion over time. Uh, facts are really important, and the stuff that Richard did is, is really critical uh, in terms of, of creating ammunition uh, for these arguments, but we need people to carry those arguments forward um, and a broad range of people. Uh, and so, so this sort of thing is, is really what makes a difference, I think. Thank you for that. Um, I'm get you to keep the mic with you, Tim, because now I'm going to ask a, a planning related question because we've sort of, we've had the engineering approach with Richard and um, the paper. Um, and I was just curious how you as, you know, an expert in the field would respond to the 
the point that opponents of the bridge put up that you know we don't have strong enough cycling use around the city yet or we don't have enough of a cycling network around the city yet we should fund other infrastructure and leave the bridge for absolute last because i think that that's something that we've not quite touched on yet in your comment about great north road being the next great addition to our mighty cycleway network brought that to the top of my hand my head. yeah our cycleway network being one one hundredth the size of our road network, um, still carries a huge number of people. Since 2016, while traffic on the bridge has been declining, 33 million people uh, rode across our very limited cycleways. 33 million trips. Uh, it's a huge number. Those are all car trips that were replaced by, in some case, maybe transit trips that were replaced by people on bikes. Uh, so people do cycle. Lots of people cycle up Lake Road, even though people say nobody get, cycles on the road. We don't see cyclists on the road as often because cycle lanes are very efficient. We don't have cycle traffic jams. You have to go to Amsterdam or uh, London now, maybe, uh, to see that sort of thing. Uh, they can move a lot of people much more efficiently than a 3,000 kilogram vehicle uh, moving down the road. Uh, so they certainly uh, do move a lot of people. People do cycle in Auckland uh, during the winter, during the rain, uh, during nice conditions. It happens all the time. Um, and it's not people dressed up in Lycra and, and uh, you know, in aero bikes and carbon fiber. It's regular people with their kids cycling to work, cycling to school. Uh, and those are the people that uh, will drive the reduction in vehicle use across the city. Uh, but they're only, we can only lure those people out of their cars if we provide safe and adequate infrastructure. So what we have is a good start, but uh, if you want a mother and her kids to get uh, to school on bikes um, or someone to commute to work in a suit, you have to protect them from the fast-moving cars. Uh, and you have to have connected infrastructure. And we need better infrastructure, certainly up to the bridge and, and away from the bridge. Um, that's a critical element. Uh, and, and we have projects that have been on the books for years to do these sort of things. The Northern Pathway uh, would have been an excellent connection. It got canceled because it had a BCR of 0.9. Point nine. It almost was even in terms of the cost-benefit ratio, ignoring things like the health benefits from cycling, of reduced exposure to pollutants for active modes and people in cars, uh, the broader environmental and social impacts. All of those things don't go into that cost-benefit ratio. Um, if we look at big projects like Grafton Gully and others, the BCR is you know close to zero. So uh, thinking of all the costs. So. You know, we have projects that could be activated that would make our network much more complete and could be built fairly rapidly. The space is there. Uh, but it's really critical uh, to realize that people do cycle on a regular basis and, and that we need to recognize that. Uh, just to share, I think one of my most terrifying cycling journeys was actually in Copenhagen. Um, I was just stuck with these cyclists. I couldn't, you know, I was, I was trying to get through. It was really quite difficult, but it was brilliant. Yeah, it was a fantastic thing. So critical mass, yeah, a lot of cyclists make a big difference. Um, don't be disheartened. You know, the good news is, as far as infrastructure goes, the shared path on the Auckland Harbour Bridge is already there. We don't need to build it. We do not need to spend a dollar taking land, building anything there. It is already there. The bad news is it's got vehicles in it at the moment. So return for investment, benefit cost ratio, there are few projects, if any, transportation projects in New Zealand that could deliver the benefits that a active mode lane on the Auckland Harbour Bridge can deliver um, very quickly and really cheaply. It's not, it's not rocket science. And just, did you, did you catch the question? Um, it was, how, how would you respond to opponents of this um, liberation, claiming that there's nothing really to connect it to and that we need to expand our existing network before we think about using the bridge. Well, it's such an obvious block. You know, it's a, as you described it, a chasm in the infrastructure. 
Um, and the other thing is, you know, people say, oh, but there aren't enough cyclists. And that is frustrating. And I did speak to somebody else in Bike Auckland about it because I was like, I keep hearing that. Mm. And she made the point, you know, she said people are looking in the cycleways for the cyclists. But the thing is, we actually move through the cycleways really quickly. We, there's, no, there's no stopping. There's no traffic lights. There's no, where you do see the cyclists is actually places at intersections when you're crossing main roads. And somewhere like St. Luke's at peak hour, there's, you know, sometimes the islands are full. There's people, you know, crammed in there trying to get across. So, yeah, we're not waiting around. We're actually quite quick when we have the right infrastructure. We can get around quite easily and quite swiftly. Um, it would be nice to have more of that infrastructure. But I think, you know, the benefit ratios on the bridge, you know, we've already got the bridge. The mm. utilisation is there. To me, we need to do the project now while the window of opportunity is there and the timing is right. So that's, to me, the, the, the key argument, not worrying about other infrastructure. You know, and if people are using the bridge, then we have to commit to the other infrastructure that comes right along beside it. Um, and building on that, um, it's popped up a few times in the answer to this question. Um, can any of you comment on what the BCR for Liberating Lane is? Has, has there been research carried out into that? Do, do we know? Um, the, the, the single stage business case, which Rod Katahi have put out, and even on quite low numbers, um, I, I'm not going to quote the number, but it, it's good. Yeah, it, as I said just now, the lane is already there. We just need to move the vehicles out of it. And the BCR, I'm going to say it's been in excess of 10. Yeah, which wow. is for every dollar you invest, you get $10 of benefits. Yeah, the, what has happened when the analysis was done was some very, very, very pessimistic, let's be generous, very pessimistic traffic modelling was done, uh, which said, oh, you need to reduce the volume on the bridge by 17,000 vehicles a day to stop network congestion. Yeah, I, I've looked... At, it's driving me crazy. I've looked at 10 years worth of data and there's not a single day when you needed to remove 17,000 vehicles to stop the bridge being under over capacity. So I'm not going to criticise people that, that write business cases. They're really difficult to do and it's not my forte. Um, but sometimes you need to say, look, we think it's going to work. Um, there's enough evidence there. There's enough precedent there to show if you provide it people will come yeah it's the old it's, it's a great quote yeah build it and they will come i always used to think that was some sort of famous phrase from some entrepreneur but it was from a film with kevin cosner in it um but it is also true you build it and they will come i'm actually just doing some monitoring ironically for qatar here on a brand new shared path in, in company coast and the volumes of people using it are triple what they predicted in the first two months of opening so don't be surprised when we need to take two lanes because one lane is no longer enough. But that's another story. <laughs> oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, one of the interesting we always refer to our uh, tra not to throw you under the bus, but traffic models. And um, you know, the problem with traffic models is they're developed by traffic engineers, and they're they're developed for the purpose of how fast can we move the highest number of vehicles. They ignore all the other things that really are important about place making about having a good place to live and the same with our BCR models they focus on what is the financial cost what is the financial benefit and forget about all the intangible things and it's really only the active modes that bring us all of those intangible benefits um, and so even with a BCR of 10 that's vastly underestimating the real benefits uh, to society, the real benefits to the people of Auckland and, and New Zealand in general that would come from a move like liberating the lane or adding, adding active modes um, to the bridge. So they're really important um, and a lot of them are unquantifiable but uh, they can be significant for sure. Do you have anything to add to that Karen? Well I'm an accountant so oh. I've done a few rate cost benefit sort of scenarios and you know the fact is they can be manipulated to show what you want to show and in the instance of the bridge 
it is about accessibility, it's about equity, it's about fairness for all modes and that's what we should be focusing on. I'm totally with Tim about that. And we have a cost of living crisis at the moment and it's such a cheap way to travel so it just seems like a no-brainer. No, I think that's a very fair comment and yes, I, I, I do agree. We often find ourselves harping on about BCRs that don't take into account you know, intang intangible benefits for people's lives. Um, I've got plenty of time for questions from the audience. So I think I'm happy to open up the floor. And I see one hand way back. I just want to know, you talked about how easy it is um, for a lane. And I presume you've done sort of the weight cost of putting the concrete to separate it. What about either end? Because that that's a common thing you hear of changing either Esmond Road or, or whatever to accommodate the cyclists. They can't go onto the motorway. Correct, they can't. Um, three things. Actually, cyclists are allowed on motorways on certain <laughs> conditions. Uh, and I was instrumental in allowing cyclists to use two kilometres of transmission gully because there was no alternative. There was no highway alternative for two, two kilometres. Um, slightly to the one side. Um, the barrier down the mid, down separating the cyclists and pedestrians from vehicles, the barrier we're proposing is half the weight of the one that Wakakatahi measured, mon, uh, allowed for. Uh, they allow for the one that they, they move with the big truck, mm. um, but in reality they have subsequently approved a much lighter, much more rigid barrier that will do actually perform better than, than the one they allow for. So the, the actual weight on the bridge, I think it's the equivalent of a of, of a, a nose to tail line of utes parked along the bridge is, is what the barrier will be, which of course is what, what's on the bridge when, when there's a traffic jam. Um, look, either end, at the north end, um, there's there's two options, uh, Sulphur, Sulphur Point, um, there's a subway where the old toll booths were, so you can get through to there. It's not great, but it's okay. Remember, perfection is the enemy of the good. And there's also a, a, a route that goes around to where the, the, the uh, boat jetty is, which currently is blocked because there's been a landslip there. Um, so the north end is, quite, is relatively achievable. Um, south side, um, you'd loop round and come drop down into West Haven. Um, there's actually a, there's, a, there's one little road there that's pretty underused at the moment, which could be repurposed, or depending on how much money you wanted to invest in it, you could put a second share path down. You could do lots of more fancy, more expensive things, which would probably come in time because the demand would be there. So getting on and off um, at each end is, is achievable. I'll be honest, access is better on the west side, both ends, but it doesn't solve the problem of wind. And also there is an absolute requirement for Wakakatahi that they have to run five lanes of traffic out of the city under certain circumstances. And you cannot do that if you convert one of the western lanes. So we're stuck on the east, which from a wind perspective is actually really good. Um, and the access is okay. I, I, I looked at it a couple of years ago uh, and I think um, it's been looked at again in, in the last few weeks. So there are options there. You can go onto the bridge from Esmond Road. Eventually. I'm going to pass on that because my geography Auckland's not that fantastic. <laughs> I think, Tim, could you comment on the Esmond Road question? Because I'm from South Auckland, so uh, you know, I have no idea where I am right yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be the, the situation eventually, right? Um, you'd be able to cross there. And then, I mean, eventually, I think the northern pathway would be revived or the lower extension of it. That, the right-of-way for the Northern Pathway was all acquired uh, by Wakakutai years ago. Um, so that's all been cleared. It's just a matter of actually building it. And then once you have that connection through Esmond, you can go up parallel to the, to the motorway and, and all the way up to Albany and beyond. Um, and those would be critical connections to the biggest population centers, 64,000 people um, you know, within the, the peninsula that could be cycling over to the CBD uh, in the next couple of years. Now I've just worked out where some road is. No, it doesn't go up that far. It sort of literally drops into um, uh, to, to, to North Coat. Doesn't preclude 
obviously more connected cycleways further north, but um, the bridge, it's, the access to the bridge itself will be from uh, from Sulphur Point. I, I would like to just put out into the crowd that, and I can't provide a title for this because I found it during a caffeine field assignment research hunt. Waka Kotahi did at one point commission and publish a report into potential ramps and access for I can't even remember if it was for the sky path or for a liberated lane, but it does exist out in the annals of the internet somewhere. Um, so if anybody is, you know, perhaps Richard might have even had a hand in that, who knows. Um, if anybody would like to have a hunt for it when you get home tonight, it's quite an interesting read. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? I see one over here and then one up here. Uh, yeah, question for Richard again. First of all, thanks so much for doing this report. It's amazing to have someone actually working on this, <laughs> finally. Um, I was just wanting to know, you said you'd um, presented this to Waka Kotahi uh, this week, did you say? Um, obviously, they haven't presumably done any anything um, back to you yet, but what was, their, what was their reaction? I'm going to ask Karen to reply, really. <laughs> um... Some of the key people were away, so we, we did present to just a couple of people in Waka Kotahi, and the official response was it was a very professional, well-researched uh, presentation, and that it would be discussed further within Waka Kotahi. So that's where we sit right now. I imagine they'll be quite focused on the release of the second harbour crossing mm. and and getting that out in the next week or so. And, yeah, we will be wanting to talk about what's happening right now. So, yeah, we're, we're playing the long game here. We're, we're in to fight the fight and get this back on the table. Do we have any more burning questions out in our audience? Ooh, I see one. I see two. Great. But I have the mic. So, you first then. Um, Andrew Shaw's my name. Look, um, Waka Kotahi had the lanes opened up in February and March for summer cycling. There was those monthly, every Sunday in February and then a last rain day in March. Did that come into your discussion in terms of their concessions around cycling and walking on the... Harbour Bridge. Oh, they didn't happen because there was a lot of rain. Yeah, so they cancelled them. But they'd obviously planned to have walking and cycling on a seasonal basis as a trial. They, they did. The, the minister asked for a trial. Uh, Wakatai came back with two events, um, which obviously didn't happen because of the, the adverse weather. Um, I wasn't involved in those, and certainly, yeah, they're not something that I've, I've spoken with Waka on. Karen? Um, well, I've often was certainly going to be involved mm -hmm. in supporting those events and working with Waka Kotahi to deliver them. One thing I will say about those events is, to me, they don't really constitute a trial, mm -hmm. and that's the difficulty. What we're looking at is behaviour change, and that takes time, you know, even a month. Who's going to give up their car park, buy an e-bike for a month's trial only to find out that it isn't successful? You know, it takes a long time and I think those expectations need to be set that, you know, sometimes, I mean, the Northwestern Pathway is a good example. You know, I've been living next to it for years and years and years and suddenly I looked at it and went, why am I not on a bike? But it took me years to get there and realise I could do it. And it will take people time to see that as a genuine option. But it needs to be available so that people can actually take it. And I think, yeah, trials are a little bit risky like that because they don't allow that change to happen. Thank you for that. Um, and we had a question by the gentleman in the teal. Right down the end, just to make it easy. Um. Karen, when you first opened the Tonight, you did mention that you think that waiting 15 years for the second harbour crossing is not good enough. Um, I'd 
be uh, interested to hear if any of you have anything to say about that sort of urgency thing, whether it's to do with the climate or finishing that bike network, which they keep saying they're going to do and keep pushing back. It's all of those things. You know, we're facing multiple crises on all fronts, you know. We've got an obesity crisis, we've got climate crisis, we've got mental health crisis, we've got a cost of living crisis, you know, I mean, this actually ticks all of those boxes in making a contribution back to society. I'm not sure why we have to fight so hard for it. it it's, it, yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. It's everything. Either of you have any comments to add on that? <laughs> Sure, I mean, so one of our kind of guiding documents now for Auckland um, is the TERP, uh, the Transportation Emission Reduction Pathway, um, and the goal is to reduce emissions by 64% uh, by 2030. 2030 always seems like a far away date, that's less than seven years from now, uh, and the way in which the TERP envisions doing that is by getting people out of their cars and onto bikes and on foot and on public transportation. And as a city, we've done almost nothing to implement that uh, in the year now since it's been passed. It was passed in, I guess, August of last year. Um, and virtually nothing's been done. Uh, and we can't kick the can for another maybe 15 years. I mean, if we look at our major infrastructure projects, uh, the, the day that we say they're going to open is usually a guideline for the next 10 years of delays. Uh, it's just there's too many things that can happen. We, we can't wait for another bridge because there will be another political party in power soon, because there will be another mayor soon, because there will be another crisis, uh, you know, financial crisis or something else that happens. Yeah. Um, and so quick, easy wins are really the only way to affect quick, easy mode shift and, and implement the things that we need to do um, for climate, for health, uh, and just to make the city a better place in general. I think just to, to hammer home the point, everything we're proposing is reversible. If it doesn't work, it can be removed. And what could I have 1.8 kilometers of HP2 barrier, which they can deploy on another site. Um, we're not looking to lock stuff in. It is really quick to do. Um, the lead time on the, the barrier, which is probably the, the slowest thing to get, is eight months. So that's why I said we could do it within a year. It's going to take a little while to get a few ducks in a row. It's, it's really quick to do. We do not need to wait 15 years. And it may well be that when Wakatahi announced their preferred option for a new harbour crossing, they might say, look, we recognise that this is going to put active modes out by 20 years plus across the, the bridge. So we're going to reopen the option of looking at liberating a lane, converting a lane, whatever they may choose to call it. And we'll be saying, hey, that's, that's great. Can we come and help? Um, because I think it is something which a degree of collaboration constructive collaboration can actually deliver something that's really good for well, for New Zealand and, and for Auckland and Aucklanders especially, and even more so for people up on the North Shore here. Um, do we have any questions from the internet? One. We've got one, okay. Uh, we, did, uh, we did have more, but they've been answered vicariously. Uh, so the one question that has come through on the internet that is still remaining is, is Auckland the only harbour slash river city in the world that doesn't let people walk or bike over the water? <coughs> question mark, question mark. No. <laughs> okay. that was uh, look, it depends on how you, you classify it. Look, yeah, I'm thinking Westgate Bridge in, in, in Melbourne is a motorway bridge and to the best of my knowledge, you can't walk and cycle over there. But there are alternatives. Yeah, there are there are alternatives at other locations. Um, it's difficult to think of a city, an Auckland, you know, apparently North Shore is part of Auckland, where you cannot easily get from one side to the other on two feet um, on, on, in, in the dry. Um, a, a example would be Hobart. Hobart has a bridge that is not dissimilar in age and, and ugliness to the Auckland Harbour Bridge. Sorry, um, the only uh, the only sort of redeeming uh, no, the only thing that's slightly different in Hobart is a ship went into it about thirty years ago and knocked a bit out of it. Um, but when they rebuilt it, it, it's still great. It has 
the two skinniest, most worrying cycle lanes I've ever cycled across. <laughs> They're about 1.2 meters wide, and every 300 meters there's a big thing that comes out, so you have to do this as you go past it. They have been open to cyclists from the day it opened, which was about 1970-something, 1960-something. Yes, they're going to put a clip on to improve it going through there, but even, even Hobart, there's nobody here for Hobart, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Even Hobart allows walking and cycling across a bridge that, on the face of it, is completely unsuitable for walking and cycling. And if they can do it, I'm sure we can do it better. I'll just add to that. I'm from Monaco, so I can say this, but even Monaco had a cycle lane across its harbour bridge from the longest time. So, you know, we can do it here. No, nothing to add from either of you? Well, I think, you know, we can look overseas and see there are a lot of big cities that have got walking and cycling in place, and they are making big steps to actually improve cycling infrastructure. You know, Paris, New York, you know, we need, to, we need to get going or we are going to lose all kind of parity as an international city. You know, clean, green, sustainable, where's all that gone? <laughs> yeah, so it would be really nice to see us, you know, pick up the pace and actually start looking like a livable international city that we can be. It would be amazing. Now, I kind of stymied the audience with my last call for questions, so... I see, I see pointing. I see, oh, I, I had, see someone with a mic. I said one more. Hi. Um, Anna here. I heard in the past that Waka Katahi were looking at some ferry system to ferry people across from one side to the other. And looking at this, it seems to me that this makes more sense to invest your money in this rather than a ferry system. Have you heard any more about the ferry system or are just behind the times has it been canned? Because I would be worried about them putting in ferries instead of um, liberation. And I, I want to add to this, um, there's also been talk about shuttle buses, you know, all sorts of alternatives. Um, the, the, the ferries... It's away with the fairies, isn't it? It's, it's just, well, look from a, from a practical perspective, the numbers just don't work. You you could you could do the numbers and, and you're on the back of a envelope, and they just make no sense. Um, I think it's been quietly shunted off to one side. Um, I'd be very surprised if it if it re yeah pops up again. Um, so from that perspective, I've not seen anything on it for probably two years now. And, and when it was first launched, there was quite a lot of fairly straightforward analysis saying this doesn't get past go. And also, a ferry is a scheduled service which is reliant on people operating it. Um, and it's not cycling across or not walking across, so it's, it doesn't actually solve the, the equity issue. I think a while ago Bike Auckland was involved in that discussion and we did look at it you know, all the elements and, yes, the time, the cost. And at the moment, the ferries aren't doing the job. So, <laughs> you know, we'd have to get specifically built ferries, we'd have to build infrastructure, and then it just starts looking like, you know, it's pales in comparison to what we're talking about here as far as value for money and the problems that it solves. So as far as I know, there are new ferries being ordered, but nothing to accommodate bikes specifically. So I, I will I will I will quickly add there has been a recent proposal for a bike ferry uh, which can carry twenty five bikes, so it's a very small one, using existing jetties, so it's a lot cheaper. Um, so that's an, a very recent one that's gone in front of council and gone gone to uh, wherever else it's gone to. I don't think it's the solution. Um, I think it would be cool, but I don't think it's the solution. We want to be able to cross under our own steam uh, the same way cars can whenever we want to, um, which is very different from jumping on a ferry. Also, 25 per trip is not <laughs> going to cut it with the demand that we're going to see. So. I also think if um, Council and Wakakotahi are after a quick solution that is small and uses existing infrastructure, then, um, well, I mean, we've got a Pretty good one up on the screen over there. I mean, it's pretty startling how many alternatives um, have been suggested to just 
using one <laughs> traffic lane. Uh, a couple years ago, we had a gondola proposed, and that seemed like a great idea. Uh, you know, a bus that can just is specifically outfitted for bikes seemed like a good idea at the time, right? And these aluminum ferries with outboard engines, uh, when we can't even get enough drivers for uh, you know our buses and ferries as it is, seemed like a good solution. The the reality is something that's put on pavement quickly and cheaply um, is the most effective way. And the more time we spend on these alternatives, is just time wasted and money wasted. If we look at how much money was spent when a bridge was proposed, the biking and cycling bridge after Skypath was canceled. $150 million was sent out to consultants and to buy up right-of-way for that bridge. $150 million. And Richard, you estimate, what, $30 million for this lane would mm. cross? We could have paid for this lane multiple times over and been done with it. Uh, but instead, we keep kicking the can and thinking about alternatives and other ways to do it. Um, the reality is sometimes a project that is effective and useful isn't that sexy, isn't that interesting. It's just good infrastructure. Uh, and it goes to this, a lot of things we do. We don't need a tunnel under the Harbor Bridge for people. We don't need a tunnel for our light rail system. We just need the simple, cheap things um, that have been proven over and over to be effective. Um, and so that's kind of where that theory is for me as well. It's just another idea that is going to cost us money and go nowhere. I just just for add, oops, point sorry. of clarity, my understanding of the figures that were released under OIA was the abortive work on the walking cycling bridge was $56 million, of which $12 million was for buying property. So I, I'm not sure whether 150 so, but, but it's still, they've still spent more doing nothing than even on their own estimates. Their estimates for converting a lane is $20 million. Their estimate for converting a lane is $20 million. I think they've underestimated it, so I've added 50%. Hmm. I just wanted to say there is a hand right at the back I saw waving earlier, so I'll just put you in the queue because um, I see somebody else with a mic. Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head when you talk about the contortions that people are going into to avoid getting rid of a car lane. And I know from discussions I've had with non-cycling friends and family and heaven help me on community Facebook pages and stuff like that, <laughs> there's a huge, huge hysterical backlash against the idea of removing any cars. And people are terrified of it and think it's going to be Armageddon and awful. And it would be really useful to know what we can do to sort of persuade people that it's not such a bad thing and, and bring along the people who don't don't see, like we do, how wonderful it is to ride your bike to work instead of being in the car. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. So we're not alone in this. So Amsterdam, arguably one of the you know cycling capitals of the world, uh, the highest mode share of cyclists um, uh, in Europe and, and probably globally, uh, recently closed down its main artery into the city, uh, a six lane, four or six lane road into the city. Um, after years of plan planning um, is a temporary thing, only for six weeks. And even in a place where it's embraced that cycling is one of the, the most important things that's happened to the city in 50 years, uh, there are still people that protest the lane and spray paint them, so there's a waste of time. And, and the minute there were queues on other roads said, open up the road again and we need to get back uh, to driving. So we're going to face that, that backlash no matter where you go. Um, we happen to be a car-centric country. We have eight cars for every ten people um, and, and a lot of road for those cars. Um, and, you know, one of the things we say is that a lot of people suffer from what we call windshield bias, right? They've never experienced something outside of the car. Um, and so take a, take a friend along when you go on a bike ride. Um, show them what it can be like to, to do that commute. For a lot of people, it's just scary. They don't know how to get to work any other mode than driving. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> in for us. <laughs> Moody moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My camera's still happy, so... Well, yeah. one thing you, I could add to that is the Netherlands also has a reputation not only for being one of the best places in the world to ride a bike, but also one of the best places to drive a car. Yeah. So the thing is, 
we will make the driving experience in Auckland better. I firmly believe that. So, yeah, we have to persuade people that give this a go. You might be surprised. Did that waving hand at the back still have a question? Kia ora. Thanks. Um, one quick question, hopefully, for Richard. In the table about the volumes, does it also take does it also does it also take into account the northern Okay, just to restate the question, does the traffic volume take into account the Northern Busway? Um, both directly and indirectly, yes. Um, what I showed there was the number of vehicles crossing. I didn't differentiate whether it was a, a car, a bus or a truck. So within those numbers, the increased number of buses are counted as vehicles. Um, so yes, the, the, the Northern Busway is in in that respect, but more significantly, um, the reduction in volumes is happened before the completion of the ring road uh, of the of the um, western western route um, and is, in, is almost definitely attributable to bus patronage um, i've lost count i did try and work out how many buses an hour and how many people an hour go across in buses and and, and it needs somebody a bit brighter than me to work out how many buses go across i even asked somebody at Auckland transport and they said Oh, that's a really good question. We don't know. <laughs> a lot. An awful lot. A, a fantastic lot. Not awful at all. So I don't know if that's answered your question. I was sort of like trying to... Because I think some people are worried about the Northern Busway being technical. The lane is still breaking. Okay. Would, uh, there is a really strong argument for saying, well, look, if you've got an active lane on the clip-on, on the outer clip-on, why don't you make the next lane a bus lane or a, oh, <laughs> that's an idea, um, or a T3 lane or, or some sort of high capacity vehicle lane. Um, anything that gets buses through quicker makes a lot of sense. And there, are, uh, there is without doubt, there are some challenges from Esmond Road down to make sure that buses do get the priority that they deserve because they're carrying 90 times more people than a car is. Um, so does that mean a car has to wait 90 minutes and a bus goes through in one minute? Um, equity. Um, so liberating a lane does not solve all Auckland's transport problems. Um, it actually brings others into focus. But hey, what a great thing to do because we need to get these things solved. Got time for one more question if anybody has any. But it seems like we've done a pretty good job at, well, our speakers have done a pretty good job at answering all your questions. I think Tim might like to talk about buses because I know he likes to talk about buses. <laughs> I am so sorry, Tim. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I agree with what Richard said. I mean, the Northern Busway is arguably one of New Zealand's most successful transportation projects ever. And it was very cheap in comparison to all the other things that we've paid for. Um, in the maybe near future, we have broad support for something like a congestion charge or a, a fee to get into the city. Uh, you know, it's it's been very effective in London. It's just been approved uh, by the entire court system in New York to happen as well. Um, and if that something like that is implemented, the demand for travel across that bridge by personal vehicle will also continue to drop for that reason. So the bus situation will likely resolve itself. Uh, but in addition, if we do something like take a lane and it creates more congestion on that road, then it will also be more feasible for people to get out of their car and use the bus because they can continue to work or read or do whatever they want while they're on the bus, which will also reduce car traffic and then we'll reduce congestion. So it's, it's all connected to each other. Um, and so arguing that congestion will affect the transportation system or taking lane will affect the transportation system is a bit of, of a straw man argument. It, 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 there will be congestion, but there are multiple ways in which that can be resolved. And it's, it's not the reason to abandon uh, something that's very feasible. Anything you'd like to add, Karen? 
I just wanted to ask you a question, Tim, which is you talked about TERP. Now, I understand that we've made commitments as a country to reduce our emissions and that actually if we don't, there's some kind of fine system that comes into play. Are you able to tell us a little bit more about that? Because I don't actually know the details. Like, are we facing, like, a financial penalty? Uh, I mean, we have international commitments that we've yeah. agreed to to essentially hit uh, zero emissions by 2050. Whether that's something that we do, whether that's something that's upheld for individual countries is, is another issue. It's hard to say. Um, and whether that's actually something that, you know, we do or not, or will achieve, um, I think is is not as relevant as to the important uh, importance of just trying to achieve something like that. So whether we face big fines or not, um, reducing emissions has huge side benefits. Um, better, you know, our, our living, our lifestyles become better when we have alternative modes which help reduce congest, uh, help reduce emissions. Um, you know, we're better stewards of the planet as a result. So there's all sorts of reasons to reduce it beyond just the potential for a fine. Um, but, you know, the things that we're doing now are not getting us towards that reduction. In fact, our emissions continue to hold steady or go up, um, especially when we talk about transportation. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's really critical that we do the things necessary to achieve that, whether we face fines or not. It's, I don't know. All right. Thank you, guys. I just want to thank the three of you for sitting down for a chat with me and the rest of our lovely audience. And I will hand this mic back to Fianne, who will end the night for us. Thank you. I'm going to actually take one of these mics because apparently these are wireless ones. Just aren't quite as good, it seems. Um, you are all welcome to sit down if you want, but you can also stay up here. Um, it's totally your call. Uh, ooh, can I go over here now? Oh, I can, but only just. Okay. Um, I'm just going to wrap up the evening. Oh, I'm being ushered. Where are you ushering me? I don't know where you're ushering <laughs> Just there. I'm going to wrap up the evening. Um, I want to quickly say uh, my first introduction to this issue about trying to get across the bridge was actually way back in about, I don't know, 2011 um, when I was in university. I was uh, at the University of Waikato. I'm from Kirikiriroa, Hamilton. Uh, and I was part of Generation Zero, who were all about reducing our emissions. We held a speaking tour called What's the Hold Up? which is all about what is our hold up for reducing emissions. And in Hamilton, in Waikato University, we had Rod Oram speak to us about uh, SkyPath. <laughs> and this was my first introduction to realizing the Auckland Harbour Bridge doesn't have walking and cycling on it, which was absolutely bizarre to me. Uh, in Hamilton, we have several bridges. They all have footpaths over them. Some of them have very tiny cycleways. <laughs> And it's just ridiculous that we don't have access for people to cross this main bridge that goes and connects our city. Um, I wanted to touch on a few things that were mentioned here. So quickly, for any of you that don't know, in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland, 45% of our emissions are from transport. Uh, and about 80% of that is from cars. So we have quite a big opportunity in this region to reduce our emissions by empowering people to choose walking, cycling, public transit. Uh, and just a note on congestion as well. Um, we have this thing called induced demand as a concept uh, you may or may not have heard of, but I'll quickly recap for you. When there is space, so if you add a lane for cars, more people drive uh, and you actually see that it gets a traffic jam pretty much straight away. <laughs> and you see the reverse if you take a lane away. So if you take a lane away, you see people start to switch to other modes, walking, cycling, public transit, and you end up with less traffic. And it seems counterintuitive, but that's how it works. Um, what we see at the moment, we see that we have room for one lane, as per Richard's presentation, but North Shore is growing. 
we've heard that there'll be the population of Hamilton moving into North Shore. Uh, and that's going to mean a lot, lot more people and a lot, lot more cars, unless they have other ways of getting around. If we give them a safe way to get around by bike, walking, public transit, if it's convenient and safe, they will choose these other modes and you're more likely to have a nice network. So you're not going to have your traffic jams. If we don't give them other ways of getting around, it's just going to be one big traffic jam and it's going to be horrible for everyone. Uh, so we really do want to provide these other modes uh, so that we have this, this better system. And that Harbour Bridge is a real big blockade to people changing the way that they get around. Here's some ideas that we've jotted down for how you can help. I'd love to hear your ideas as well. Uh, we have, along with a lot of other organisations, signed an open letter to Waka Kotahi, pushing for them to liberate a lane now. It's online at liberatethelane.nz. You should go and check out liberatethelane.nz. Um, and there's a whole lot of cool blogs, positive news stories, resources that you can use that are there online. We would love for you to share the open letter with organizations and businesses that you know uh, and encourage them to sign on as well. It's a living letter. <laughs> so we want to get as much support on there as we can and show Waka Kotahi that this is really important. Show the mayor that this is really important and Auckland Transport as well. Uh, other ways that you could help, would you like to write a guest blog about why this matters to you? We want these personal stories out there um, that could be sending a blog to us at Bike Auckland or it could be sending it as an opinion piece to the media and just getting those stories out there about why this matters in a really human way. Is it trapping you in your car? Is there uh, a real tangible benefit that you would have if you had a lane? You can support by uh, becoming a Bike Auckland member. <laughs> we, uh, we rely a lot on our members and our volunteers. If you'd like to volunteer, hit us up. <laughs> Wear your Liberate the Lane t-shirt that shows support for the campaign and it might start some discussions. There's a few on that table still left. If you didn't grab one, these are free for tonight. But after that, you have to buy them. <laughs> Um, we also want you to encourage organisations that represent you to sign the open letter. So people like AAs, how many of you are an AAs member? Put up your hand. Yeah, imagine if just a whole bunch of people connected with them and said, hey, we want this on the Harbour Bridge. You represent us, supposedly. If enough people go to them, they might actually put their support behind it. And there's some posters as well that are up on that site. We think it would be really cool if you just printed some and popped them around for people to have a look. So they have some of the talking points that you've heard tonight, some of the reasons it's doable. Uh, yeah, have a look, liberatedelane.nz. And I'll do a quick karakia to close. And then there's some food at the back, and you're welcome to stick around and talk, uh, and you're welcome to help us pack down. <laughs> Ete atua. Tene te mutunga, kua mutu te ronga, kua mutu te kaha, kua mutu te mahine, kua pai, humi e, hui e, taiki e. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to all our fantastic panellists. Thank you to Sahil for being the awesome moderator. Got caught on very last minute, so thank you so much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nadia, for doing all of the work. <laughs>